Good afternoon, everybody here, and good morning to folks in California. Um, this is our third um, and final for this semester talk in our um, in in the UMass School of Public Policy's um, Engagement and Outreach Committee's um, series of book talks. Um, it's our fourth event. We had a we had a post-election kind of um, I don't know what to call it, you know, an interesting discussion session slash therapy slash and slash, you, you know, uh, anxiety airing and that I, I was grateful to see everybody there. Um, I'm David Mednikoff. For those who don't know me, I'm the chair of the Outreach and Engagement Committee and um, professor of Middle Eastern Studies and Public Policy and chair of the Judaic and Near Eastern Studies Department at the University of Massachusetts. I'm hoping you can still hear me. And um, I'm really, really delighted um, to uh, have um, our own Lee Badgett um, give a talk on her latest book. Um, in addition to all of her many professional accomplishments, um, which I'll, I'll just briefly touch on since we, we know Lee and Lee knows us well. Um, you know, Lee is just one of my, one of the most nurturing and wonderful and amazing and um, thoughtful colleagues that, I, that, that I've been able to work with in all the years I've been here. So it's a distinct pleasure to be part of um, this new book project and talk. Um, so Lee is, uh, Lee, Professor Badgett is um, a professor of economics. She was director of, um, the, of the School of Public Policy in its prior um, version of the, as the center um, from 2007 to 16. So a lot of the reason that we're here and can celebrate the book is Lee's leadership in the past for which I, I know personally, I've been very grateful. Um, she is a, fa the fac a faculty coordinator of the Center for Employment Equity at UMass. And for California friends, she's also a distinguished scholar at the Williams Institute of, uh, uh, on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Law and Public Policy at UCLA's Law School. Um, this is your fifth book, right, Lee? Um, there's a edited yeah, volume. Yeah, one edited volume, one edited volume, right. yeah, yeah. So Lee is gonna um, talk to us about her fairly fresh off the press book, um, The Economic Case for LGBT uh, Equality, How Fairness and Equality Benefit Us All. Um, and, you know, I, again, I'm giving a very brief intro to Lee, but Lee is very engaged in all sorts of transnational and um, local and national policy circles around um, economics, um, marriage, LGBTQ um, rights. And so I'm, I'm certain that this book is already making a big splash globally in policy and, you know, with the incoming Biden administration will, um, will be very significant. So we're very lucky to get a preview of what I'm sure is going to be a series of discussions um, around this book that we're going to see take place on the global and national stage. So with that, um, let me just after um, Lee speaks for 25 to 30 ish minutes, um, we'll have plenty of time for you for you all to have thoughts, questions. Um, and I know that Lee will be very generous about anything that you have to say um, or questions that you might have. And I, um, I'll try to moderate based on people raising their hands in the participant screen or you know physically doing this if need be. Um, and yeah, uh, I look forward to a really stimulating talk and to learning more about this wonderful book. Um, take it away, Professor Badgett. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thank you. It's really, it's, it's always great to see familiar faces out there from different uh, parts of UMass and maybe even some, some West Coast folks. Um, uh, and uh, I would be happy to kind of talk about sort of the, where this book sort of came from. Um, and definitely, I feel like you have to talk about why you need an economic case for LGBT equality. Um, but I want to start with just kind of presenting what that case is, and then we can uh, 
And then we can jump into kind of the meta level discussions too. So uh, on one level, most of the time when we think about, well, what in my prior work and lots of other people's work, we think about whether or not you know, stigma and discrimination or exclusion um, are uh, how, how they might affect the lives of LGBT people. And on the flip side, because you know you can you can either kind of look at this from the, the bad side or the good side. <laughs> let's 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 take it from the good side. What's what are the benefits of uh, of inclusion? And I think there's not any great surprise to say that uh, that those would be good for LGBT people themselves to not you know be subject to discrimination, stigma, violence. Um, but the case that I'm going to make is slightly different. It is that uh, that it's also good for our economies uh, at the country level um, to uh, to to have. A, full LGBT inclusion and equality. And my argument is pretty simple. Here's the path that it takes. It goes through human capital and economic potential. Um, so in this way, it's a very traditional kind of economic argument. And that is that inclusion means that people can fully develop their human capital and their economic potential and use it in, uh, in our economies. And that, that's the main path that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, because I think that is the main path that, that there is. Um, so just to, to walk you through the three basic areas that I think are really important to think about if you're thinking about human capital. One is education. We know as economists that education is a, is a fundamental driver of economic development and of economic growth. Um, the problem is that for LGBT people, it, uh, it doesn't always seem like a great investment kind of process. So the photo here is a, a young man named Pema Dorji. He's a, a gay activist in Bhutan. And he has told his, his story very publicly about uh, his schooling years. And he says, going to school was like going to a war for him. It was like going to a war because he was harassed, he was bullied, beaten by his, by his classmates. His teachers saw this behavior and not only did they allow it to continue, but they told Pema, it's your fault that you're being treated this way. You can change this. Um, so, you know, schooling is a place where we go to learn many things, but what LGBT students learn is they may very well be targets. Um, that kind of experience, that sort of bullying, is something that clearly hurts LGBT students. Um, and we have uh, we have effects that go beyond, you know, the, the completely unsurprising idea that there's uh, harm to mental health and physical health, but it also hurts them in their ac academic performance. They have lower grades from being bullied, higher absenteeism. They're more likely to drop out. They're more likely. They're less likely to continue on uh, to get more schooling. And so there is a, a squeezing out of this economic potential um, and uh, a, a lessening of the value of the education that LGBT people get, as well as maybe having, uh, having less of it. Actually, but you know, one other thing that was very interesting that I learned in, in working on this book is that it turns out that bullying actually also hurts everybody else in schools. Uh, there are studies that show that schools that have higher levels of bullying of any kind um, actually are poor performers as a school on average on things like math tests. So, so bullying is something that's gonna hurt individuals and it's gonna hurt everybody uh, in the school potentially. But for, for the purposes of my argument, it's, it's about this kind of lower quality and quantity of education. Now, the first place that that becomes really important for the economy is in thinking about what happens when people go into the labor market. The most common kind of uh, experience that we think LGBT people have as LGBT people uh, is either actual discrimination or, uh, or fear of discrimination, expectations of discrimination. We know this because when you ask LGBT people, have you ever experienced discrimination? They say yes. In the United States, about one in five uh, LGBT people say they've had some kind of unfair treatment in the workplace. In, uh, in the EU, a very recent study that came out last spring showed that also about one in 20 LGBT people on average in the EU are uh, report that they've experienced discrimination fairly recently. We know that gay and bisexual men on average have lower wages. There's a wage gap uh, compared to heterosexual men. Uh, there's also a wage gap for lesbians compared to straight men and, and to gay uh, bisexual men. Um, we've done, uh, sociologists and economists have done experiments 
all over the world testing out whether a gay applicant and LGBT applicant is treated the same way as a heterosexual applicant or a cisgender applicant by sending out resumes that are constructed, they're, they're totally fictional people, and they're constructed to be exactly the same in terms of their qualifications, the amount of schooling, place, places, type of schooling, um, experience levels. Uh, they're, they're really identical people and they just add one little line to the LGBT one, either that somebody was, uh, um, was uh, uh, part of an LGBT group at their university, for, for example, or for transgender people, sometimes they'll have a, a birth name that other records might be found in. Um, but some way of indicating that these two differ either with respect to sexual orientation or gender identity. And, and pretty much every survey that's uh, experiment that's been done like that, LGBT people are less likely to be invited to get a job. Um, so that's, you know, that's only one part of the hiring process, but having discrimination there is likely to have ripple effects on up to uh, the process of, of actually getting a job offer, getting a job, staying employed. So we know there's differential treatment from all these different sources of discrimination um, and, 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 and research. What are those effects of discrimination? Well, economists in, in general, uh, this is a kind of a very mainstream economic argument, uh, but, it, but, but uh, when you are discriminating against somebody, you're not taking into account the, the best use of their knowledge, their skills, their creativity. That's the, you know, the big package of, of human capital. And if you're not putting them in jobs where they are uh, doing something that's their highest valued use of time, um, you are holding back the economy in some way. Um, another way to look at it is um, if you've got workers um, who are fear fearful of discrimination, which is a, a concern uh, that people have knowing that it does happen, knowing people that it's happened to, then, um, then you might be less productive partly because you're holding back information about yourself, staying in the closet, not fully interacting uh, and engaging with people in the workplace. Um, you might be likely, more likely to leave a job because of the, uh, the treatment that you experience as an LGBT person. All of these kinds of turnover and lower productivity, the closet, inefficient uh, use of, of the workforce, these are all uh, examples of ways that um, that discrimination against LGBT people is going to hold back our economy from its uh, its potential its potential output. The last area that I want to talk about um, that's I think is really core to this to this claim that there's an economic case for LGBT equality, and that has to do with health. Literally, uh, stigma can make you sick. We have, frankly, seen this. I think in the COVID crisis, where we have very high rates of of, uh, of illness and deaths for uh, Latino and uh, Latinx and uh, African American Americans. Um, uh, but it's the same kind of uh, minority stress that uh, that is affecting LGBT people. Um, so the idea is pretty simple. Every day, we're all subject to stress. Um, but there are some kinds of chronic stressors that exist for people because of stigma. And it, it can actually be, it can actually be racism, it can be sexism, and it can be homophobia and transphobia that create that extra load on our, our psychic systems, our ability to cope with, with things that happen to us. Um, the energy that we have available to, to cope is tapped. It's already maybe tapped out. Um, and that means that people are vulnerable to illness. We have lots of research all over the world that shows that LGBT people have higher rates of anxiety and depression, for example, higher rates of suicidal thinking, higher rates of HIV, experience higher rates of violence. They have higher uh, rates of substance use. All of these are examples of, um, of health conditions that are bad for, for human beings, right? It's bad for our well being. And it's also bad for our economies because when you're sick, you're not able to, you know, to fully function. You may not be able to work at all, um, and that means that our economies are losing out on on uh, the talent of people who are sick because of minority stress. So that's the that's the basic kind of microeconomics, I guess I should say, about uh, uh, about this argument. Um, and let me just look at another important actor on that side, which is businesses. 
businesses for a very long time in the US and now increasingly globally are making what they call a business case for LGBT equality. Uh, so this, is, this has been going on for several decades and you know, big businesses all over the globe um, have taken very clear public stands in many cases about, uh, about how bad uh, the poor treatment of LGBT people is for their business interests. So this, uh, these company names that just popped up on, on the screen are, uh, are you know, big global brands. And what they have in common is they all signed on to a Supreme Court amicus brief in one of the marriage equality cases uh, in the United States. Uh, and they make this case very succinctly. Uh, the discrimination, discriminatory laws impedes business efforts to recruit, hire, and retain the best workers, puts them uh, and uh, keeps them uh, keeps us from giving them an environment that enables them to perform at their best. So they're making this case not just uh, locally when they decide to um, to have to uh, add voluntarily add protections against discrimination to their own non-discrimination policies or to offer benefits to same-sex partners or to offer gender affirmation treatment uh, in their health insurance policies, lots of other things that companies do. Um, but they say that one of the big reasons why they do it is because it's good for their businesses. And uh, there's a lot of research that backs that up. So uh, some colleagues and I, a few years back, comb the literature for uh, for studies that looked at what the impact of more supportive environments was on LGBT people who uh, in the workplace. And we found lots of studies that showed, and those blue bars on the right side are basically the numbers of studies that show this, greater job commitment, greater improved health outcomes, increased job satisfaction, more openness. These are all things that are good for LGBT people uh, for, for their health and well-being, but they're also uh, good for businesses. A second way to look at this is kind of a new uh, generation of business case research that's showing that we can take companies, look at the policies, and then see if they have better outcomes when they have more supportive policies. And in fact, that is exactly what many studies have shown, that companies with more LGBT positive policies, they have higher stock prices, you have higher profits, higher productivity, and uh, there's at least one really interesting study that suggests that non-discrimination laws actually have enabled companies in states with those non-discrimination laws to um, attract a more creative workplace. The, the last little data point that I'll mention is, is really the power of businesses to alter the environment uh, when it comes to thinking about public policies. Uh, a few years back, actually my home state, North Carolina, passed what has become known as the bathroom bill, a bath, it's, it was the bathroom bill at the time, there's been some others since then. But basically it required, uh, it required uh, uh, the state of North Carolina, the businesses and, uh, and public accommodations to discriminate against transgender people. It, re it basically required that. Um, and uh, many businesses responded saying, well, you know, that's actually not a place that we want to go build a new facility. That's not a place that we want to come rent that that building that we were thinking about renting. So companies as large as PayPal and Deutsche Bank went elsewhere. Um, uh, the NCAA uh, basketball tournament that year went elsewhere. Uh, the NBA All-Star game went elsewhere. Taking business out of North Carolina because of the bad climate that it had created. And that cost the state at least $4 billion of, of investment and of, uh, of entertainment spending, um, which is actually ironically, uh, disproportionately actually gonna hurt heterosexual and cisgender people because there just aren't that many LGBT people who work for those companies, right? So, so it's having, it's creating harm for the economy and it's creating harm in many cases for non-LGBT people. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the whole uh, sort of micro level case for this. So you might say, well, how does that, how does that add up? Can we actually kind of add that up to country level economies? Um, sorry, if you hear my dog having a very loud snack in the background, I'm not sure why that's so loud. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so country level economies. One way to look at it is to ask, well, what if we compare countries that do pretty well with regard to rights for LGBT people to those that don't? Um, and so uh, the first study I did of this with some colleagues uh, 
um, looked at this uh, for a bunch of emerging economies, for about 38 emerging economies, you know, low to middle income countries that are growing quickly and have caught the attention really of, um, of, uh, of, of multinational companies. Um, <clears throat> And we looked at the number of laws, that's kind of on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis here. We looked at the number of laws that a country had that were inclusive of, uh, of in this, on this slide, it'll be um, homosexual orientation. And uh, uh, so these are things like de decriminalization, non-discrimination laws, family rights. And we compared it to uh, GDP per capita. And this is just plotting those, those data for uh, 2011, and you can see a pretty clear positive correlation. Um, when you have more rights, countries tend to have higher levels of GDP per capita. We did something similar with a, a transgender rights index um, that was available at the time. That's It's not as widely available to, to kind of immediately tap into that data. So we just have this one year, but uh, this time we had 14 different rights we were looking at, but see basically the same positive correlation with GDP per capita. Then we did that thing that we like to do in economics. We try to control for everything else that might influence um, uh, influence uh, countries' GDP. We went back to 1990, so we're looking at this over about a 30-year um, period or so. Um, and um, what we found was one additional right uh, was associated with a, a $320 GDP per capita. In, in, actually not increase, let me put it this way, uh, a, a higher level of GDP cap per capita of about $320, which is about 3% of GDP. We did this with a much larger sample of countries later on. This is actually a paper that's in the world, in world development, um, where we found that one additional right uh, actually uh, was associated with more than $1,000 in additional GDP per capita. That's probably because we'd added in a lot of high income countries. So that, and that persists even after controlling for, for things like, uh, uh, you know, education level, human capital, physical capital, other things that matter for countries, the economies actually, and it persists even when we include a measure of gender equity for, for these different countries. So there's clearly a correlation here. Um, I'm not gonna uh, make a claim that this is an exact causal link. You, if a country passes one law, will they immediately get a thousand dollar boost in GDP per capita? No, of course not. Um, and their political scientists suggest there are reasons to think that um, richer countries are more likely to be open to individual rights. Uh, so we can we can talk more about that later if you're interested. But but because of that ma micro level foundation that I talked about before, I think at least some of this is likely to be um, to be related to the link from LGBT inclusion to GDP per capita. The last thing I'll mention is a couple of other efforts to try to add this up in a different way, um, to take all the different kinds of disparities that we see in the labor market and in health. No, nobody's yet been able to do this yet with education, but, um, but to at least take what, what we can measure and try to put a financial value to it and then add that up. So I've done that in India and in the Philippines, other people have done it in Kenya and South Africa. And what we find is overall that um, somewhere around 1% of GDP is lost because of the treatment of LGBT people when you look at it this way. 1%, you know, it always sounds like a small number, right? Um, but if you actually apply that to the global level, 1% of global GDP would be the economy of Turkey. It would be the economy of the Netherlands. Um, if we look at it for any given country, I think what we're looking at is something kind of like a, you know, a, a structural self-imposed recession that we're talking about. It's GDP that is lower than it otherwise should be. So that's the, the basic, um, those are the sort of basic pieces uh, of the argument that I that I'm making in in the book to say that if we had uh, if we had more inclusive a more inclusive society we'd have better outcomes for LGBT people and we'd have better outcomes for everybody. Now the last thing I will say is just a little bit about why I uh, got interested in this and why. Um, why I think it's important that we have an economic case. We have a great human rights case for LGBT people. And I think really that's probably the best case for LGBT people. But my argument is that if we can 
show how that's connected to the economy. It's a, it's a complementary argument that has the potential to open doors. It can open doors to get access to policymakers, decision makers who are very powerful, but maybe are not really fully invested in the human rights uh, argument for anything. <laughs> um, so that could be business people, that could be development banks, that could be larger multilateral development agencies. Um, it could be policymakers at individual country levels. And so I know uh, I, I actually got into uh, to working on this because of the, uh, the desire of a lot of activists to have something to go along with the human rights argument, something in addition that would open up some of these other doors that they were having a hard time getting into. So um, the last thing I'll just say is that, you know, at least some, some action items coming out of this uh, are that, yeah, you know, a lot of this will be about changing laws and policies. Um, and in order to make that happen, I don't think that this is an invisible hand argument. I don't, I'm not trying to make an argument that says, because it's in countries' economic self-interest, of course they'll pass these laws because we know that they probably won't, that there are other countervailing political issues, for example, or cultural issues that will, will hold back um, their ability to capitalize on this without some work by somebody on the ground. Um, certainly businesses who now is, talk about the business case for uh, LGBT equality and even sometimes say, and we also think it's the right thing to do, those businesses you know, didn't wake up one day and think, oh, how could I make LGBT people, workers in my firm, you know, how can I improve their lives? That's not what happened. What happened was lots of LGBT organizations within those firms got together and said, let's make a case to our CEO or our HR people that we need to change policies. So I think this is also true with regard to using the economic case, the larger economic case. It will mean we need to have good, strong, well-resourced LGBTI organizations on the ground to, to make that case and to, to try to get those, to pry those doors open so that they can talk about it. I think it also means that we need better data um, so that we can measure how well are we really achieving inclusion. It's really great to have laws and policies, but uh, what we've seen in the United States so far is that laws and policies are not enough for equality. We've seen that with regard to um, policies against racial discrimination, sex discrimination in the states with uh, laws against sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. Things are better, but they're not they're not uh, as, as, as well uh, along towards equality as we want. So we need good data so we can monitor that uh, and, uh, and measure progress and also to create benchmarks so that we can hold ourselves and hold other countries to, you know, uh, to uh, some kind of accountability with regard to, to meeting these, um, both these human rights standards and, and standards that will actually, you know, make a big difference for everybody in those countries. So, uh, so I'll stop here and, uh, and would love to, to hear your thoughts and, and comments or questions. Thanks. And I'll to stop sharing so we don't we can look at each other instead of the, my little open door slide. Great. Thank you so much, Lee, for that, you know, really um, great model of, you know, how to do a clear, um, really insightful and, um, and efficient um, book talk. I think, you know, not, not only is the substance really, really useful, but I think the way you just do it is, is a great model for everybody here. All right, so the floor is open. Um, I will, I, I got the participant screen open, so feel free to raise your hand in the participant screen or, um, or in the chat if you like, um, and I'm happy to hear from everybody. And, you know, I know Lee is very generous about asking, answering questions or engaging on any act, aspect of her talk and kind of policy activism in these issues generally. See, Jane, I know Jane has to leave early, so maybe we should go. Should we yeah, go ahead, her? Jane. I saw Jane and then Michael. But, yeah, but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be like the first person at the buffet table or something. <laughs> um, this is a, 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 just a question of curiosity. There, uh, you know, um, the, the lay of the land in other countries far better than I do. There are some countries where it's like, you know, um, homosexuality is demon possession or they're very primitive beliefs in the comparative work that you've done do you 
go to countries when you see um, possibilities there. In other words, people or organizations have invited you um, or there's some opening or there's movement. And for, for countries where it just seems like I don't know. There are these, you know, really horrible um, beliefs, and do you just stay away from those countries? Mm-hmm. What have what is your sort of your entry and relationships been like with respect to openness of of countries or various groups? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. There are still somewhere around seventy, give or take two or three, uh, seventy countries that criminalize homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, I think, at least five to seven where there's a death penalty attached oh, to it. So, so there are some countries that would be uh, uh, a little uncomfortable to go to. But it's, it's also important to kind of keep in mind, you know, does anybody know what year the United States decriminalized homosexuality? 2003 not very long ago. (laughs) So there was a long-term process of states, some states unwinding uh, uh, the so-called sodomy laws that criminalize homosexuality, but it wasn't until a Supreme Court decision in 2003 um, that uh, that things changed. And, you know, so so it doesn't always tell you much about what's going on on the ground. So so it's not a great, uh, uh, it's not a great indicator Maybe the death penalty countries would be places I wouldn't go, but I have found myself in other places sometimes not really realizing I was, I remember going through the passport line in Ghana, going to a conference and coming out the other side and looking up this large poster that said something like, uh, sexual deviance, you are not welcome here, (laughs) go home. (laughs) And, you know, you kind of reading through, it was clear they weren't really just talking about child sexual predators, you know, that they had a pretty broad idea about that. And uh, I have to admit that gave me some um, nightmares uh, that I don't normally have uh, when traveling. But, uh, but, but, there, but there are a lot of places that have pretty uh, repressive laws where people are doing great work, really um, amazing activist work and human rights work. So, so yeah, so I think, um, I think it's important to kind of take that whole big picture into account and thinking about where we would go. I I take that big picture into account. And I think the other thing is actually the other thing that I also think is very important for those of us in uh, uh, higher income countries where there's lots more um, support for LGBT people is, is still just to recognize that we're really all developing countries when it comes to LGBT rights because we, because of the deficits that we still see in health and economic well-being in the United States even you know we're a country that's not you know it's not a model um, so um, I'm not sure that got it what you were what you were curious about but yeah so again um, please you know feel free to in the chat, um, mentioned that you want to speak or have a question, and I, I welcome questions from everybody. Um, but I saw Michael Ash before. Uh, so no, my, my hand was just up by mistake, but I will ask a question. Um, so uh, you had mentioned political scientists who might say, "Oh, well, maybe these are more likely in um, in countries that are that have advanced economies." And I, I guess I've, I've been interested in a number of different contexts about sort of highly developed rights frameworks in poorer countries. So like Kerala and India is often held up as a model. And I was just curious if you if you saw in your research, are there any countries where you say, wow, that country, you know, it, it has a lot, a lot of disadvantages, but it is really, uh, you know, um, it is both kind of advanced in developing a rights framework and also benefiting from that, from that mm-hmm. rights framework. Are there mm-hmm. any, you know, kind of, um, shining examples you'd like to uh, to uh, to share, please. Yeah, I mean, I think South Africa is one that's uh, commonly pointed to in the Constitution when South Africa, you know, became uh, a democracy. Uh, um, they uh, and was throwing off apartheid. They had uh, a, a, they included specifically included sexual orientation and the list of things that could not of, of people who could not. Be discriminated against legally, and so that's why, 
it was the first country and so far the only country in, in Africa to, uh, to legalize same-sex marriage, for example. Um, lots of Latin American countries have really good uh, laws on the books. You know, they're like Brazil, Argentina, they're still kind of uh, um, contested. Uh, there still is not as much actual support measured as from public opinion for LGBT issues and people uh, there, as you would think, uh, given how far along they are in terms of policy equality, but they, but they do have a very strong record of equality. So those are a couple of, um, of examples. What, what are the forces that advanced those in the, say, say take the South American cases or, or the South African case? What kind of forces at work made, uh, made those happen? Uh, you know, again, it's, sorry, that's a very developmentalist view, but I, was, you know, I would say quote, unquote, early, but please don't yeah. take it that way. I mean, yeah. obviously, as you pointed out, we can be, you know, yeah. Yeah, well, I think some of the things that people have pointed to, like Javier Corrales, who's a professor at Amherst College, uh, who's uh, done a lot of work on this in Latin America. I mean, he points to, um, to, to two kinds of things that happen, sort of the, the development of democracy that allows for, for voices of, of minority groups to, to have, uh, you know, more visibility. Um, also, um, you know, kind of the, um, the political paths from dictatorship to democracy involve a lot of coalition making and, and people working together in different kinds of ways that that have, um, I think, led, uh, in many people's view, led to both in South Africa and uh, uh, Argentina. I'm trying to remember the other countries Javier points to, but but have, at least, and at least some countries kind of developed those really close ties that have uh, uh, meant that the kind of LGBT people sort of got moved along with the same, in the same kind of wave. Um, uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the other things, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, Catholicism is a funny kind of factor that, that sometimes has, I think people assume that it holds back LGBT rights and LGBT progress, but, you know, that depends a lot on how, how the church is seen in different countries, uh, what its role has been, you know, so despite a lot of church opposition, marriage equality passed in Ireland and got passed in some Latin American countries, even though there was not a lot of support for it from the church. So, so it, it does get complicated in thinking about all those other factors. And I, I'm not great at kind of just sort of cataloging them, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but, it, but they are really interesting questions. I mean, every country kind of has its own path, uh, in different ways. There were some common paths to marriage equality, um, which was another book from a long time ago now, but, uh, but, but in those other, those kind of unexpected countries, I think it was a different kind of path. So um, again, I want to encourage, um, you know, students and other people to, to weigh in in the chat, um, you know, for the, especially for those of you who don't know Lee's work well, she's, you know, spent a lot of time in very different ways as you can hear advocating and connecting to many transnational and national fora around um, framing um, better LGBTQ policies and rights. So, you know, there's lots of lots of great ways we can go. Um, before calling on my colleague Lenore, I'm going to exercise a quick moderator's um, prerogative to ask a, a very um, follow-up question directly related to, to Michael and Jane's. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, what I'm hearing, Lee, is that, you know, the sort of um, the rights approach and the economic approach are not only harmonious, but, you know, they sort of go hand in glove. And and so I think Michael was pushing a little bit on where is the rights approach, you know, where are unexpected places the rights approach might be um, working. I'm wondering about since, you know, this is your book is on the economic case now, the reverse side of that. I mean, are there places where you see that it would be more likely or possible for the sort of economic benefit, you know, workplace or other arguments um, to push things before um, rights might actually be activated. And I'm, I, of course, as a Middle Eastern specialist, I think about this a lot because, you know, the, mm. the, all the, most of the countries where you're talking about where there's death penalty um, and discrimination are all, are all ones that I study. But I'm wondering about how the economic approach might actually, you know, put the cart before the horse around rights. Yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know those things. I think um, I will say the places 
that seem to me to be using this argument um, in kind of interesting ways uh, and in ways that cut across uh, different policy approaches is in Asia. Um, and um, there are, uh, and I think that goes, a, a lot of it may go along with the fact that there are lots of multinational companies in those, in that region of the world that, um, move people in and out. And so the uh, circulation of ideas uh, is enhanced by that. The circulation of policies, uh, I'm doing some case studies now at the Center for Employment Equity. Actually, I saw Adrienne jump on. Uh, she was working with me on this last year, um, trying to understand how companies expand policies from say the US into, into, place, into other countries or other regions where um, sometimes they may, not be, they may not be as welcome. So it's, it's, it's a tricky process. Um, but I think that, uh, um, that in those cases, it's, uh, you know, it's enabled, it's enabled activists, I think, to make some inroads even where you wouldn't expect. So like Singapore is always like the counter example people give me, like Singapore criminalizes homosexuality, its laws are really, there's nothing good there about laws towards LGBT people. And yet there's a little bit of, of softness of that policy. You know, there's some uh, policymakers have said, well, you know, we just don't want to talk about it. Or we just, you know, of course, you know, LGBT people exist and uh, should have, um, you know, we know they're there. Um, but uh, when it came to their, uh, their version of kind of a pride celebration, they call it the pink dot, where everybody dresses in pink t-shirts and huddles together to show how big, you know, the <laughs> LGBT community is. They had this for a long time. And then a couple years ago, the government of Singapore said, okay, you are no longer, uh, people who are not uh, citizens of Singapore, or maybe I can't remember if permanent residents are allowed to, to attend, but you have to either be a citizen or permanent resident to even attend this celebration. So the idea was let's take out all the Westerners, you know, who are there working for multinationals, I guess, and it will just, you know, maybe it will just be a ha tiny handful of people. Uh, the other thing they said was, oh, and multinational companies, you can't, you can't give any financial support to that event either, even though they had in the past been doing that. But what happened was many more people came than in the past and they found a lot of local businesses to sponsor uh, to sponsor the the event. So, you know, at least some of that is about kind of recognizing sometimes it's about the power of the the so-called pink dollar, you know, or, or pink peso, pink yuan, whatever it is uh, that uh, that um, companies are attracted to. Uh, but but it has, you know, it can be used even in places that seem like they're just way behind the curve uh, from where you would expect them to be. I hope that gets it at your at your question. Thank you. Yeah, I, and I actually wonder whether slightly less globalized cases where there might be something like this going on would be uh, that I know are Jordan and Lebanon. Those would be ones that you know mm. I'd be talking to you about. Um, but while we wait for more of you to jump in, uh, I know my colleague Lenore uh, also has a question. Go ahead, Lenore. Yeah, thanks, and thanks, Lee. That was a really interesting presentation, both the substance and as David said before, your style is great. I learned a lot <laughs> about how to be clear. Um, and it's great to see a bunch of SPP students on here. And I'll also just double down on David's point. Yeah, it's okay to ask questions. <laughs> so uh, jump in. Um, I wanted to ask, um, sort of coming back to the US, just for your thoughts about the policy agenda for the new administration. Um, in terms of LGBT rights um, and how you might think about sort of like the development of the business case in the US, both at the state and federal level over this next period. I'm really interested in the sort of, you know, whenever companies are making a business case for anything, uh, just their, their own self-interest in doing so, but mm -hmm. just how you see this um, movement developing and, and, you know, what policies you think uh, should be advocated for in the near yeah. term. Yeah, yeah, that's a great set of questions. So uh, it makes the most sense if you kind of go back to a, to the Obama administration, where they they you know recognized they were that's not going to get anything, <laughs> not going to get anything through Congress, right? So they um, they ended up enacting a lot of things through executive order and you know regulatory change. Uh, and um, try to you know, advance equality in educational institutions and workplaces in that way and healthcare settings. 
and um, and uh, those were things that were pretty, you know, the, the reason why we like have passing laws is because they're a lot harder to change. So the Trump administration was able to change many of those things that the Obama administration had had put forward. So, you know, so if Biden comes in and we still are not 100 percent sure about the Senate, you know, but but it doesn't look like he's going to have an easy path to really advanced legislation. So, um, so that's, you know, I, I personally think that there'll be kind of a return to that, you know, reversal of the things that Obama did maybe, <laughs> and trying to find new ways to, uh, to, to use, uh, you know, kind of more administrative means of, of achieving some of the same ends. Um, but the good news is actually there was one really important thing that changed in the landscape this just this past summer, which was this uh, decision in uh, Bostock v. Uh, Clayton County, Georgia. So this was a, um, a set of three cases actually that went to the Supreme Court um, where the Supreme Court had to decide is discrimination against LGBT people sex discrimination? And that was the claim that had been made uh, in the Obama era um, and actually was made by the EEOC, both in the Obama and Trump era. So like the EEOC and the Trump Department of Justice were on totally different, you know, sides of this. Uh, um, and uh, ultimately, I think to a lot of people's surprise, there was a resounding vote, six to three, in favor of saying, yes, it is. It is discrimination, sex discrimination. And so it's kind of been written in now to read into uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So it is now kind of pretty settled that, uh, that uh, employers are not allowed in any state in the country to discriminate against uh, LGBT people. Now that doesn't necessarily apply to education or to healthcare settings. You could apply the same logic and that's what um, some future cases are trying to do. Or you could just pass a law that's very sweeping <laughs> and that's what the Equality Act, uh, which has uh, been the latest iteration of a civil rights law is trying to do. So it would cover public accommodations. It would cover, you know, uh, every, just about every setting that you can think of where there's sort of federal civil rights law. So, uh, so I think there'll be an attempt to kind of push on that, but what, how far that will go really will depend a lot on the, on the Senate. Um, the, uh, so the economic case gets made in all those settings, um, not so much in the judicial settings, but, uh, but, but uh, you know, one of the highlights of any uh, hearing on the Equality Act or its precursors is to bring some high level executives uh, in to say, we think this is good, here's why, it's good for our businesses, it'll be good for everybody's business, you should pass it, you know? So, so it does get used in that way and it gets used at the states in that way. But to me, I will just say the most interesting thing, and I haven't written this up yet, so I have to be careful about what I say so that this company that I'm studying can approve of it. But companies are starting to become more proactive on these issues. They're not just saying, oh, it's good for our business. But sometimes they also say, and if you pass a really bad law, we will think about whether or not we want to keep doing business in this state. Uh, so, so it can get used in you know a couple of ways like that. So we'll see, we'll see. I think that's you know that's kind of uh, kind of a new a new angle that uh, that I think we don't really know exactly how far that will go yet, how far businesses will really push on that to to at least prevent bad things from happening and maybe also push to to make good things happen too. Thanks, and that ties actually quite nicely um, into a question that I saw in the chat from Alexander Kellogg. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask the question? Um, sorry, I haven't read your book yet, so I don't know if you've answered this already. But do you know how effective, like, the argument is is um, the economic argument is in persuading people to support LGBT rights? Well, I have one example I can give you, <laughs> which uh, um, I think kind of answers that question uh, in the most direct way that I know of. Um, so I was invited to Australia a long time ago, eight, eight or nine years ago, uh, to talk about marriage equality and some research that I had done there and did just a, a kind of a little back of the envelope estimate about how much um, the first Australian state to legalize same-sex marriage might get in terms of wedding tourism and a boost to small businesses that support the wedding economy. And I was uh, asked to go speak to some, uh, some 
men from the Small Business Council uh, in Hobart, Tasmania, which is actually a really lovely place. And I learned that Tasmania is like one of these destination wedding places. So they were very interested. Everybody in Tasmania was very interested in this argument. And so I sat down with these two guys um, and sort of, you know, gave my little spiel, just kind of said, here's, you know, here's how, here's why we think this is good for businesses, because there's a lot of wedding spending. Here's some estimates based on some data we have on the Australian wedding industry and the number of same-sex couples. And uh, I got to the end and I just kind of stopped, took a breath and waited for them to react because I never like made this argument before in a way that somebody kind of had to respond. <laughs> and they said, oh, wow, we had never thought of that. That makes total sense, <laughs> which you might say, well, okay, you know, they just said that to be polite. But in fact, not very long after that, their organization started making a very strong, strong statements in favor, both of Tasmania being the first uh, uh, state in Australia to recognize same-sex marriage uh, and, and the making a strong stand in favor of the country doing it and ultimately uh, it had to be done at the national level there so um so they really put their you know their their political mal the uh, money or talk where they're where they're you know kind of polite talk wise so i do think that in some cases it can matter i think there are there certainly though are many cases and i'm not uh you know, I'm not naive about this, where it's just used to support an opinion that a policymaker already has. Um, and they think that that makes it sound more rational. And that's okay, because it does. And, <laughs> and they make they, they say it because they think maybe it will, you know, uh, you know, mitigate some of the backlash they might experience from shareholders if they're business or voters. And, and, and that's okay, because they can they can make that argument, it could still be a correct claim and argument and they still they might use it more instrumentally you know but that's yeah that that's the way ideas get used a lot of times in the policy process i think yeah that's just a really wonderful and clear example of how policy framing you know with we all do our learning to do really can matter and by the way for those of you who don't know lee's written a wonderful book on framing and you know sort of putting your ideas out there that that is also worth checking out um uh, we have a question from, is it Kai or Kay? I'm sorry for getting your name wrong, but go That's ahead. That's all right. It's Kai. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight into whether there are economic benefits for countries or regions that accept um, LGBTQ migrants or asylum seekers. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think... Uh, I don't, I don't know of any research on that. Um, and I think uh, the, um, I, I, would, I would say I would put it, you know, in kind of the same category as larger arguments around immigration in general, you know, about thinking about what, um, what migrants of, you know, whatever um, uh, oppressed group they might belong to, what, what, you know, kinds of strengths they might bring to other countries. Um, I think you know that may be a little bit of a challenge in cases where people are, you know, sort of economic migrants. But we have, you know, we have a story that we tell a narrative here that is, you know, is about exactly that about people's contributions to the economy. I think the problem is that sometimes asylum seekers, in particular, are you know held back by laws around their inability to participate in, you know, in uh, in labor markets of the, on the same terms. So, so we may not actually fully realize those. But, um, but I will also say that we don't have a very good handle on how many people we're talking about there. At least for LGBT folks, uh, I think that is a, uh, you know, that is kind of a, a challenge. Um, but these economic issues. Uh, uh, are important in lots of different kinds of contexts. I'll just say that um, where, I, where I, my own research is, is now going towards looking at programs that provide um, opportunities for low income LGBT people to, to gain skills and to, to gain access to better employment opportunities. Um, and uh, there certainly are some efforts to that have targeted uh, migrants and well to have targeted asylum seekers so the Kukuma refugee camp in in Kenya for example I attended a really fascinating uh, virtual tour uh, a couple weeks ago where we met um, people who were um, who were uh, 
making um, hand sanitizer and soap and other kinds of things and, and raising chickens and other kinds of things in an attempt to, to build, you know, kind of internal businesses that would benefit themselves, give them some kind of access to, to incomes, but also, you know, and this is the logic of the market that have value to other people. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there are, I, I do see a growing amount of interest, not still not enough, but at least some interest in, uh, in, in asking questions like that about how we can, how we can work with, you know, refugees and asylum seekers and, and other migrants to, to try to, you know, to improve their ability to contribute to economies. And I think that, that there's some big challenges for LGBT people. So I would love to see more effort in that direction. Great, thanks. We do have time for, I think, one one or possibly two more questions or comments if anyone wants to weigh in. Please don't be embarrassed. Um, and, you know, again, for those of you who don't know um, Professor Badgett, she has a very, um, you know, I was, I was wondering about this myself, but you, I mean, you have a very long um, kind of trajectory where you've been engaged in kind of the economic arguments um, and activism around LGBTQ rights. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you want to say something about how, how that feels these days versus how it, it might have when you were starting out or, um, you know, you want to say more about kind of where you're going from here, but that might be interesting for, for students to hear too. Yeah, well, I think, you know, my trajectory has been, you know, from really focused on being focused on the US to now thinking more globally. And I think I, these arguments I work to develop, you know, with colleagues in different places, you know, over time here, mainly here in the US. And, you know, that created sort of a menu of opportunities of other ideas that activists in other countries could say, hey, could we just, could we say that here? You know, what would that look like? And so I think that has been useful. What it has meant, it's, it's interesting though, because there is a difference that I've noticed at the global level. There's much more, uh, there's much more focus. I hope this doesn't come across in a bad way, but there's more focus on, I think, fairly abstract human rights uh, for LGBT organizations at the global level and in many other countries. And I think sometimes the, some of the activists that I talk to worry about that because they say, that's great. I hope we can do better on that. But, you know, uh, my people need educations, they need jobs, and there's not enough focus on that. And I think that's really, you know, something that this economic argument um, can also contribute to is to start to think more broadly about what human needs are and how we need to be thinking about them beyond, uh, um, you know, be, beyond human rights as a, as a principle. Or in addition to, I shouldn't say beyond, but in addition to. Great, thank you. Um, any last question or comment from anyone before we call it a, a late morning, early afternoon? <laughs> All right. Well, good luck okay. with the rest of the semester, everybody. It's nice to see right. you all. So thanks thank you so much to everybody. And thanks so much to, to Professor Badgett. And I just want to say that we're going to have, this is our last event for this semester, but we're going to start, you know, in um, early next year with more really great social justice oriented and diverse um, presentations.